But Jesus came so that our identity would no longer be what's been done to us, but our identity would be found in what's been done for us. By who? Jesus at the cross. They may have done me wrong, but he did me right. They may have stolen and robbed from me, but Jesus died on Calvary that I could receive the blessings and the riches of my Father in heaven. There's nothing that a man can do on this earth that Jesus didn't undo at the cross. Well, hi, friends. James Epperly here. Thank you so much for tuning into the program today. I believe that what you're about to hear has the power to transform and revolutionize your everyday life. You know, anytime we approach the Word of God with an open heart and an open spirit, man, He can do the miraculous. So let's jump into the Word of God together, and I'll see you right on the other side of that. All right. Well, let's jump in our Bibles to Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. And last week, we kicked off the entrance of a message series entitled Neighboring Well. Can everybody just say that? Neighboring Well. And through this whole month, we're going to really be looking at how to love people, witness to people, be a light to people, and really just be a good neighbor. Right, We understood from last week that neighboring well, uh, yes, it has to do with your neighborhood and those who live around you, but it's so much more than that. It is really whoever you come in contact with in that moment, you are a neighbor. Last week, if you weren't here, we uh, understood that we are chess pieces in the hand of our God and that we need to look at every single assignment as simply that, that anywhere he moves us to, our job, the grocery store, our neighborhood, that we are sent there with a purpose and on a mission. So it would be diligent for us to uh, understand and seek why are we here, who are we to be a light to, um, and who are we to minister to as we walk out our day, as we, we go through life. And that would help us so much if we understood that whoever we encounter is a God encounter. Right? You're like, well, there's no way that that lady who was nasty and mean to me was a God encounter. Absolutely. Because obviously there's something else going on in her world, and God just puts you right smack in the middle of that situation so that you can show what true kindness looks at. Like, amen? So this is a real practical message series, but I think it's really foundational for what God wants to do um, in the church in this hour and in this day. So Luke chapter 10, verse 27, and this is Jesus. And he answered, And said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So this is a question coming to Jesus. And uh, trying to say, hey, Jesus, you know, there's a lot of commands in the Jewish Old Testament. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of do this, do this, do this. And, and Jesus just kind of boils it down and says, listen, if you just love God with every ounce of who you are and love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to be okay, right? Like everything else will be fulfilled if you just do that. In other words, what he's saying is if you do this, you will live the best life you can possibly live. You can live the best life you can possibly live. How many of you want to have a good life while you're here on this earth? Jesus boiled it down. He said, love God, love people, and you're going to be okay. In verse 29, and he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who exactly is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Interesting question. I don't know that he liked maybe Jesus's response too much. The fact that he had to turn around and ask Jesus, well, then who is my neighbor? Like boil this down even more to me. And in response to that, Jesus goes into a parable that we all know pretty well. And it's the story of the good Samaritan, the story of the good Samaritan. And if you know the story of the good Samaritan, I'm not going to read it all today for time's sake, but there was a man who was uh, beaten and robbed and left on the road and several different passerbyers came by and each of them had an excuse of why they could not help the man. They were busy doing this. One had a great excuse. They were a priest and in the temple and he had to get to Sunday service. Well, God has to, you know, you have to find somebody else. I am on the Lord's mission and on the Lord's work, Right. 
and left him there. Well, one man came by and said, I, I don't even know you, but you're my neighbor. Why? Because I'm a chess piece in the hand of God. And he picked up the man, took him to the inn, gave the innkeeper some money and said, listen, take care of him. When I come back, I'll give you whatever I owe you. Just do whatever you have to do. And Jesus is answering the question, who's my neighbor with that illustration, right? Like, like we can't brush this off as well. They don't live within 30 feet of my house. Therefore, I am not responsible. Come on, somebody. Who I encounter is my neighbor. Whoever I come across that is in pain and is in need and is, in, is hurting and needs a friend, they are my neighbor. So as we break this down today, the first thing I want you to know is knowing who you are is necessary to being who God's called you to be. Knowing who you are is necessary to being who God called you to be. And I think sometimes in the church, in the body of Christ, there's a lack of clarity in our lives and we can become confused about who we are as a Christ follower, right? We, we come into the kingdom and we all have a history. We all have a past. We all have an upbringing. We all have an old nature. We all have a, a background of hurt and, and family drama. And, and, and on the surface, there's you know, if we don't, aren't careful, those things can seep into us as new believers and try to identify us as a new believer based off of who we were in the past and what we went through in the past, right? But your Bible says that when we became a new creation in God, old things were passed away. Come on, somebody. It says we are in the world, but we're no longer of the world. That when we became followers of Jesus, something in us should have changed. And we break our identity with who we were, what we've been through, what we've come through, all of that drama. And we realize that now we are a new creation in God. I'm bringing this up because for us to really get what I want to share with us today, we have to understand and identify who it is that God has called us and meant for us to be. We got to know it. We got to know who we are in God. So in the story of the Good Samaritan, there are four different people that are represented. And I'm going to use these chairs to help illustrate this today. Four different people in the story of the Good Samaritan, and all had a purpose, all played a role. And I think in identifying these four roles, we're going to be able to see who it is that God has called us to be. First, we see the villain. The villain is the taker. It's the one who attacks, and we're going to break these down in a little bit, but it's the one who hurts. It's the one who wounds. It's the one who steals. It's the one who destroys. He's the one who who found the innocent man and stole from him and hurt him and attacked him. We have the victim. The victim is obviously the one who was hurt by the villain. The victim is the one who needs help. The victim is the one in the story who needs healing. We have some bystanders. In this story, it happened to be some priests and Levites who should have known better. They were the ones who missed the opportunity to make a difference in the life of somebody else. Bystanders have an opportunity in front of them, but often hesitate and many times literally pass on the opportunity to make a difference. And then we have the good neighbor, who's the one who is willing and has the capacity to act in love. The one who picks the hurt victim up off the street and says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I'll pay for it. I'll do what it is that I can do. And in this story became the hero of this story. Today, let me just help us by saying, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's only one of these chairs that you belong in. And my goal today is help us get in the right chair and embrace who God has called us to be. Amen? When I started today, I talked about how you cannot be who you are or who you're called to be if you're hindered by the noise around you, by a past that's behind you. So we have a calling. And if we're going to embrace that today, we have to be people of a different mindset. We have to be people who are rooted and grounded in the 
word of God and who God has created us to be. So when I become a follower of Jesus, I open my heart, I open my life up to Jesus, and I say, I will now receive my identity and my instruction from you and no one else. Not from the media, not from the secular world, not what, you know, friends and family, not what my past screams at me, but only what you have said I am and who I should be. Come on. Why is this important? Why do I keep bringing this up? I bring this up because I believe that God has blessings for each and every one of us, but in order for them to come into fruition in our lives, we have to be in the right role. We have to be in the right space. We have to be in the right place. We have to be being obedient to the call of God in our lives. In other words, if we're sitting in the wrong seat, we can't expect the right blessings. I think one of the major things that sidetracks believers and the church is that we often, when we read scripture, we find ourselves wanting to be the hero of the story. Well, I am David and I'm coming to the the valley and I'm going to bring down my Goliath. But really, if we evaluated the situation, maybe sometimes we are the villain. Maybe sometimes we are the Goliath. Come on. We don't like to hear that, but, but, but we don't receive the blessing of God as long as we live in a delusion and just paint a picture of ourselves in the story of how we want to be represented. But really, if we back up, maybe I was the one with harsh words. Maybe I was the one who did the damage. Maybe I was the one who wasn't kind. Maybe I was the one who didn't obey the command of God when God told me to do A, B, and C. And therefore, I've become the, the, the Goliath in my story. But it's only when we recognize who we're really called to be and we can have a good essence of self-evaluation and then we can read the scripture and then we can say, God, who am I in this? And then when we can realize that, we can then adjust it and get in the right role. Come on. And then when we're in the right place, in the right seat, in the right role, doing what God's called us to, then we can see the blessings of God released in our lives. But if we're in the wrong chair, we can miss out on what God has planned for our life. If you're in the wrong place, if you're occupying a space that God hasn't meant for you, there's only one right role for a follower of Jesus. So Jesus asked the question, what is the greatest commandment of all the commandments? He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And he said, love your neighbor as yourself. This might feel on the surface like a lightweight kind of teaching and, you know, just about being nice to your neighbor and something that, you know, they would teach in kids' church. But come on, this is foundational. This is what everything else in the Christian life is based on. I don't care how good you can prophesy. I don't care how many scriptures you can quote. If you don't know how to be a good neighbor and walk in the love of God towards other people, every single one of the other giftings was all about building up other people, not your own kingdom. So if those giftings aren't being released out of a heart of, I love the people of God. I love the people of this world. I love those who don't look like me. I love those who are different than me. I love those who are hard to love. Therefore, I will operate out of the gifts of the spirit to build them up. Come on, somebody. But in the church, we've used it as a weapon to tear other people down and build our own kingdoms. So though this might seem juvenile and, you know, well, this is a good kid's message. No, no, no. Everything else in the kingdom is based off of the principle of being a good neighbor and loving people. Come on, somebody. If we don't get this, we get nothing else. That's why I said it's so important that we're in the right seat, that we're driving and we're going through life in the right seat. Otherwise, we're like, you know, I know God said he's not a respecter of persons, but it's happening for everybody else and not be. Could it be that you're in the wrong seat? His word's true. You're just going through life as a victim or you're going through life as a bystander or maybe you're going through life as a villain. And God says, I want to do it for you. I want to pour blessing on you. I want you to, to succeed in life, but I can't go beyond the seat that you're sitting. But listen, if the enemy can get you in the wrong chair, you're going to miss out on the blessings that God has planned for you. Understand this, that what you believe affects how you behave. Affects how you behave and determines who you become. 
So what you believe affects how you behave and determines what you become. So if you believe wrong, come on, you're going to act wrong and you're going to become wrong. We got to make sure we're sitting in the right seat. We got to make sure we have a right believing. We got to make sure that we're able to self-evaluate and understand who we are. Psalms chapter one, verse one through three says this, blessed is the man or woman who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Do you see what he's saying here? Blessed is the man who's positioned right and has a right view and a right way of believing and a right way of living. See, we can't claim the blessings without practicing the principle. Blessings come and knocking on my door. going to chase me down. No, it ain't. No, it ain't because you're not walking the thing out right. Well, you know, this Jesus stuff didn't work right for me. Well, because you didn't work it right. Come on. You want it to work for you. You got to work it right. So he says, if you want blessed, if you want the blessing, then be different from the world. Don't walk in the same path as the wicked. Don't stand in the same path as sinners. And don't sit in the seat of a scoffer. He didn't say blessed is the one who just does whatever they want to do, acts however they want to act. Come on. Listen to what he goes on to say. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He's thinking about it. He's pondering the ways of God, checking himself against the ways of God, aligning his life. God, is this, is this how you want me to act? Is this how you want me to be? Is, is this who I am? And blessed is the one who gets their positioning right and their believing right. And when we get into the right place with the right thinking, man, it does something and it can open up the windows of heaven. Come on. Actually, the Psalms goes on and he says, listen to this. He says, verse three, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Who? The one who walks in the right place and sits in the right seat. That's who. The one who takes seriously the, the call of God on their life. The one who pursues God and meditates on God. The one who, who's not in the wrong place. Each of us today are becoming something. Whether we like it or not, our bodies are changing. We're getting older, right? You can try to stop it all you want, but it's happening every day. And the same way as your body will change every day, whether you like it or not, you and your spirit man are always becoming something. You're always becoming something. You're either growing towards God or you're growing away from God. There is no stagnant place in the faith. There is no, well, I got that. Now I'm good. I'm good for a few years. I'll just kind of hang out. No, you're either growing or you're sliding away. Come on, somebody. So we're always becoming something. So this is a thing that we got to have a, a, our hand on. We got to have our focus on to make sure that what we are becoming is what God wants us to become. Amen. Why? Because our believing and our behavior determines what we are becoming. Your marriage is becoming something right now. Your family is becoming something right now. And that's why it's so important that we are in the right place, not the wrong place. Come on. Why? Because if you're in the wrong place, if you're sitting in the wrong seat here, it will affect your family. It will affect your home. It will affect your workplace. It'll affect everyone that you come in contact with. I think there are villains in our homes right now. Now again, evaluate. Maybe it's me. Maybe don't just push it off as what's well, my spouse, you know. But there are villains in our home, but it's often not the person who's maybe tangibly stealing. It can often be the person who is undermining the blessing that God has for their home and their future by being in the wrong place with the wrong belief and bringing dysfunction to their house by being a negative person. 
by bringing negativity, always speaking down to your spouse, always speaking down to your children, never encouraging, nothing's ever good enough. Do you see what's, what's happening? You've become the villain in your home. So villains don't always come from the outside. Let me explain it to you this way. If your child tells a lie, our natural response would be one of be like, what are you doing? You're a liar. Why are you lying? How could you be a liar? You know, if our kids steal something, what are you, a thief? How dare you steal? Instead of saying things like, no, we don't, we don't do that because we're truth tellers. We're Jesus followers, so therefore we tell the truth. And no, no, we, we don't steal and take things that don't belong to us. Why? Because we're Jesus followers, so we honor people. Do you see the two different ways? One is approaching the home as a villain, tearing down, saying things like, you're this, you always... What am I doing? I'm becoming a villain and I'm speaking into the identity of that person, of my children, of my spouse, of my coworkers, you know, those who work under me at my job. Oh, you always mess this up. You never get this right. What am I doing? I'm not neighboring well. I'm speaking until their, to their identity. I'm making them believe something in their, their, their mind and their heart versus coming and saying, hey, I know you got it wrong there, but I believe that you can get this. Let's just study this a little bit more. Let's work on this. How can I help you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Now we're neighboring well. We have to be careful. We have to be very self-aware that we aren't coming to the table as villains. So I want to talk about each one of these really quickly. To sit in the seat of a villain will cause you to miss the blessing that God has assigned to you. When you're in the seat of a villain, you will often justify attacking other people. Well, you know, then I'm going to teach them how to talk to me. I, I don't deserve to be talked like that. And, you know, if they're going to come at me, I'm bringing it right back to them. And we justify our response. However they talk to you doesn't negate the fact that you're a follower of Jesus. It's quiet, but that's all right. I'm not afraid of it. Not all villains are overt. Some are covert villains. In other words, not all villains just come out and are in your face. Some villains are sneakier. There was an angry mob who brought a woman who was committing adultery to Jesus. And in their righteous stature. And listen, here's what's interesting about this is the, 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 these men found this woman committing adultery and they, they took her and threw her at the feet of Jesus and said, now Jesus, the law of Moses says that this woman ought to be stoned. And here's what's so interesting about them. They weren't wrong. That's what the law said. <laughs> they weren't wrong. Do you understand what I'm saying? So sometimes we can get so justified within ourselves. Well, that's what the Bible said. Listen, I'm not changing the word of God on nothing. And I'm not saying that we do. But I'm saying is sometimes we like to apply a standard to other people that we've missed ourselves. Because Jesus, when they threw the woman at his feet and said, what should we do with her? Jesus goes and starts just drawling in the sand. Not satisfied with his response, they question him again. And Jesus sits up and he says, well, let the first one of you who has, is without sin cast the first stone. Now, we don't know what Jesus was writing in the sand, but some uh, theologians say that maybe he was writing out some of the sins of the men who were gathered there. And that when they saw, oh yeah, that one's me over here. And then he says, hey, you who's without sin, I already know, cast the first stone. They weren't wrong in, 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 in the law of Moses. 
but they were trying to apply a standard to this woman that they had all missed themselves. What am I saying? I'm saying love covers a multitude of sins. I'm saying sometimes the best thing that we can do is get our nose out of everybody else's business and just make sure that I myself am sitting in the right seat and let God be God and let God work on other people and let God judge other people and let God work out their salvation for them. I told you last week, Melody Hilton says, where I don't, they don't ask my opinion, I don't give it. And I've, I've been practicing that because I'm like an opinionated person and it's like, I'll just inject my opinion everywhere. But I'm learning and I'm trying to be like, listen, if they don't ask me, I'm not going to give it. Why? Because asking is now that open door. Yeah, that's the open door. Hey, hey, now I can share. Here, here's what I would do. Here's what saved me. Here's what transformed my life. Here's what I've found. Outside of that, I'm going to let God be God. I'm going to let God love people, and I'm going to love people, and I'm going to be a good neighbor, and I'm going to keep my nose out of other people's business, and I'm just going to keep focused on God. I told you last week that we are accountable for what we know means if I know your stuff, I'm accountable to pray for you, to stand with you, to believe God for you. Amen. And I've got a lot on my plate. So sometimes the best thing I can do is please don't tell me. Please don't, God, please don't reveal anything else about anybody else to me because I, I'm full. Well, friends, we are praying for you. And I pray that this message has encouraged you and reminded you that God has good things in store for you. You know, Whenever you approach the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, it can totally transform your life. It can change you from the inside out. And I'll tell you what, when something changes on the inside, it always affects what's happening on the outside. So I want to give you an opportunity today to make that decision. To, If you've never asked Jesus into your heart or into your life, then this can be your moment. This can be the day that everything changes for you. The Bible says that if we our heart and confess with our mouth, and man, we are saved. So I want to encourage you, if you've never done this before, pray this prayer after me. Believe it with all of your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you right now. I confess that I'm a sinner and that you are the Savior. I repent of my sins, and I ask you to be my God. And I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that I am saved. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Now, if you've prayed that prayer today, we want to put some free resources into your hands to help you get started on your journey of faith. Don't just make a prayer and then move on, man. Dive into this thing. Grow in your faith. Be all that God has created you to be. And you can do that by hitting the information at the bottom of your screen. We just want to get some resources into your hand to help you start the journey of faith. So thank you so much for watching this program today. If you need prayer, if you want to connect with us, man, all the details are right there on your screen of how you can do that. But thank you so much. It's such an honor to be able to come into your world and bring the good news of the gospel. I'll see you next time.